Good morning. It's great to see all of you today. Would you stand? Would you welcome those around you to worship? We're glad you're here.
Thank you. Please be seated. Great singing to start out this service, and I'm so glad you've come. Uh, maybe you were out last week. The holidays are really now over, and you're back, and we're going to have a wonderful year up ahead of us. I've already met some folks in the room who are here for the very first time, and I want to welcome you. And I've already talked to some folks. This is their last Sunday. They're going to be leaving. But if you're here for the first time, I think you will find First Baptist of Alexandria to be a warm family church. We'll be your family. Maybe you're from far away. We want to be your family as you are living in our area. Please come back and be with us again. Somebody handed you one of these programs and all the announcements for the day and the week and the days up ahead are there, as well as an insert with the order of worship, and we'll be following it. And on the back is a listening guide for the message that I'll be preaching in a few moments, so you'll want to keep that handy. If you're our guest, please take a moment and fill out a communication card. They're in the pew rack. Tell us about yourself as much as you're comfortable sharing, and then drop it in the offering plate at the end of the hour, and we hope you'll come back. Now, would you bow with me and let's pray. Father, we gather here this morning grateful for the night's rest and excited about what's happening in our church. We're so glad to be here, and Lord, we know you have come to meet with us. So we pray that in every song, every uh, verse of Scripture, every prayer that is prayed, Christ will be exalted today, and we'll be drawn closer to you. Lord, some are here out of habit, and it's a good habit to come to church but I know there are others on these pews who are here in desperate need. They need direction, and I pray it's going to happen in these moments we spend together. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
We praise his holy name by our very lives and how we lead them each and every moment of the day. Would you stand? Let's continue to worship together.
in the trial and the change one thing remains one thing remains Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your Never runs out on me Your love never fails 
runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Thank you, guys. I think we'll be singing that all week, won't we? Great, great song. Well, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. That's our text this morning. But while you're turning, if you were not here last week, and a lot of you were not, last week we distributed prayer covenant cards for 2015. We don't do this every year, but we need to do it this year to call our church to earnest prayer for some specific things. And so I've enumerated seven things I want you to pray with me about every day in 2015. Now, last week it was in the bulletin, but today at every exit you'll find one of these yellow cards. Please pick one up and look it over, and if you can, sign it, date it, and put it in your Bible or somewhere you'll see it, maybe on your bathroom mirror, somewhere you'll see it every day, and join with me in prayer for these matters. We're soon going to be entering into a major renovation project for our church, and I am so looking forward to having room up here. It's kind of dangerous on Sundays trying to maneuver up here, but we'll have space and so many other wonderful features. But this year, we're going to be raising the money for it, and we need to pray for divine intervention. So that's one of the planks on here. This doesn't constitute your entire prayer life. You'll be praying for yourself and your family and your needs and world situations as they crop up, but make this a part of your praying. So pick up a card before you leave. First Timothy chapter 6 is our text today, and there's a listening guide on the back of the order of worship, so you may want to have that out and, uh, and follow along and maybe jot down a few things. Audrey and I have discovered a new television program. It's not new, but it's new to us. We discovered it over Thanksgiving holiday. They have one of those marathons, and uh, we saw several episodes running entitled Shark Tank. Have any of you seen this program on ABC? Shark Tank. Highly acclaimed critically. It's a reality program, unscripted, but it is absolutely real. A panel of self-made millionaires and billionaires, like uh, Mark Cuban and Kevin O'Leary and some others, They're there, and one by one, young entrepreneurs come out, and they are seeking support from one or more of these individuals. They've got an idea. They've got a business that's up and running, but needs an infusion, a major infusion of cash. So they put their best face forward and try to appeal for funds. The uh, panel, they're there asking their questions, and they're vying with one another to see who's going to be the one, if any of them, will support this venture. The young entrepreneurs hope to get rich. The panel hopes to get richer by a wise investment. But the program is really all about money. Money is a big deal, isn't it? It's a big deal in our world and in our lives. I know it is in yours as it is in mine. But the Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Be careful with that verse. It doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. It's often misquoted that way. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We know it's the source of problems in marriages and in families. This past Sunday night, 30-year-old Thomas Gilbert Jr. went to his father's condominium in New York City and murdered him. The reason was daddy was threatening to reduce his allowance. He's 30 years old. His dad underwrites him $3,000 every month for living expenses. He doesn't work. $3,000 every month. And he had threatened to reduce it by $200. And so the son killed his father. It's the source. Loving money, making money the center of our lives can be the source of all kinds of problems. Well, I want to show you where that is in the Bible. You've heard it, but where is it found? 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. 
Chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Well, if you could have those two things, godliness in the way you live your life and contentment with what you have, great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. I hope you know that. That's a truism, whether you're religious or not, Christian or not, that's true. You brought nothing in, you can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Here's the verse. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, and you know them, you know some of them, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Skip down to verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope or their trust in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I love that line. There's life, and then there's true life, and I think that's what you want. Let's talk about money, since we all live in that shark tank. Number one on your listening guide, pursuing riches can ruin you. Pursuing money can ruin you. Notice what he says in verse uh, 10, verse 9. People who want to get rich. He's not, he doesn't say people who are rich. He says people who want to get rich fall into temptation. That's you. Maybe you don't have a lot, but you sure would like to have it. You're chasing it. You're working long hours. You've made it the priority. Pursuing money can ruin you. Exactly how much money do you think it would take for you to really be happy? Somebody asked John D. Rockefeller, who is the richest man who's ever lived. In, in today's dollars, he died in the uh, early 1930s, but, but in his day, in today's dollars, he was the richest man who ever lived. Multi, multi, hundreds of billions of dollars. Somebody asked him, how much will be enough for you? He thought about it and he said, a little bit more. A little bit more. How much would it take for you to be happy? They've done studies and they found out that having great wealth really doesn't make you happy. Now, you don't believe that, but it's true. It is also true that if, if you attain a middle class standard of living, you are happier than the very poor. That is true. If you have a good salary and you have a roof over your head, you have food to eat, you're not worried about tomorrow's bills. You are happy. Now, you think if you had much more, if that just multiplied, you'd be that much happier, but it isn't true. What studies indicate is that to really be happy, you give. It's giving money, not possessing money, that really brings happiness. Are you chasing it this morning? Are you pursuing it? Well, the Scripture says those who do that, who want money, loving money, they are wandering from the faith, and they've pierced themselves with many griefs. You know people that's happened to. They used to be very active in church. They used to be very committed Christians. But then they made a little money. And they got that second home or that third home, and they got that RV. And now they could go anywhere on expensive vacations perennially, and we don't see them much. And, and no church sees them much because they found something else. Pursuing money can cause great griefs. Just this week, our former governor in Virginia sentenced to two years, and that's a light sentence, two years 
for selling his office for $177,000 in gifts and loans and vacations. Yeah. You can start out so well, but pursuing money can ruin your life. But now there's something else. Having money can be just as bad. You're chasing it now. You want to have it. But when you get it, what are you going to do? Having money can be just as bad. The Bible has a lot to say about wealth. A lot to, many of Jesus' parables are all about money, material things. And the reason the Bible puts so much, you think I put emphasis on it, Jesus put more emphasis on it. The Bible is filled with commands about wealth and how to handle it. And the reason is that it can so easily become an idol for us. And the Bible is very clear that we are to have no other gods. There's one true and living God. And we commit our lives to him, and we cannot serve God and wealth or anything else. But money so often takes the place of God. And the reason is because money has some of the characteristics of deity. So it's not an accident that this happens to us. Money has many of the characteristics, like uh, God protects us, and money can do that. Money can build a hedge to protect us. Money gives us security. We don't have to worry about some things that other people have to worry about. Money can make us feel guilty sometimes, and I guess God can do that too when we've wandered from the path. So riches share some characteristics of deity, but not all of them. There are certain things that are true of God that are not true of wealth. For example, God is omnipotent. That means he can do everything, anything. He has all power. But money doesn't have that. Money is not omnipotent. Money can't cure you of an incurable disease. Money can't stave off death. Wealthy people are on sick beds and they die like everybody else. They came into the world with nothing and they're going out exactly the same way. Money can't change that. Money can buy sex, but it can't buy love, real love. Money can give you momentary pleasure and happiness, but it cannot give you joy, like we were talking about a few weeks ago, that inner disposition of peace. It can't provide it. Might buy you some friends like uh, it did for the prodigal son, but you'd never really know. You'd never really know if that person was your friend or not, or only was tagging along only in your entourage because you always picked up the check. You'd never know if they really are your friend. Money's not omnipotent. And God is eternal, but money isn't. Money's here today and gone tomorrow. One week, your, your, your stocks are high. The stock market closes 200, 300 points up. But the very next day, it collapses two or three or 400 points. Here today and so easily gone. That's why Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Moth and rust and, and thieves will get it. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where they are eternal. They cannot be stolen away. I think the ancient pharaohs understood this. You know, when they were buried, or any rich in ancient Egypt, they would bury with them in their tombs great wealth because they understood they'd be dead a lot longer than they had been alive, and they wanted to take those things with them. Turn over to Luke chapter 12 for a minute. Very familiar story that Jesus told, Luke chapter 12. And look at verse 15, chapter 12, verse 15. Then Jesus said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. It's not true that he who dies with the most toys wins. He's saying here that is not true. Your life is more than that. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. 
and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of goods, good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Your wife's next husband will get it. It's not yours. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Things are not eternal. They're here and then they're gone. John Wines, a New Mexico uh, citizen, just a week or so ago, he's retired. Uh, he stopped by a, a gas station on, on his way home, and uh, he bought, on a whim, he bought a lottery ticket. Uh, and he scratched the five numbers, and he won. He won $500,000. He was elated. This was going to change everything about his retirement. And then they told him that, sorry, sir, there's been a misprint on that ticket. It's our mistake. We realize that whole batch was misprinted. But we don't pay off on misprints. So he had these dreams of $500,000. As a consolation, they gave him $100. Money is not eternal. And it can ruin you because what we do is we begin to put our trust in it. We begin to put our confidence, our hope in material things. Now, the fact of the matter is all of us are rich as Americans, as people living in this nation. We kind of won the lottery there, don't you think? To live here, to live where we do, when we do. You've got a house. You've got a roof over your head. You've got clothes to wear. You got here somehow this morning. So by the world standards and by historical standards, every one of us is rich. But let me clue you in on something. If you're a Christian, and most of us in the room are today, followers of Jesus Christ, then we don't really own anything. We don't possess anything. The wealth of the universe belongs to our God. He has made you and me stewards of that great wealth. We're managers of it to varying degrees. Some have more than others, but it's still not yours. It's God's wealth entrusted to you. And he will judge us on how faithful we are to that. F. Scott Fitzgerald famously said, let me tell you something about the very rich. They are different from you and me. Ernest Hemingway replied, yeah, they're different. They've got a lot more money. And that, that truth came home to me this week when I read about that ex-wife of, uh, of Howard Hamm, the CEO of a major energy company. In the divorce settlement, he wrote her, hand wrote a check to her for $975 million. Now just think about that number for a minute, $975 million. And she refused to cash the check. Evidently, that wasn't enough. Now, I'd already put that in my sermon, and then a couple of days ago, I saw uh, online that she, uh, somebody talked to her, probably her accountant, and explained some things to her, and she has now cashed the check, and it is in her Oklahoma City Bank. Yeah, different attitudes about money. What's your attitude as a Christian about wealth? Well, here's what uh, Paul says to do. Go back to chapter 6 and look at verse 18. Command them, here it comes, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. First of all, what you're supposed to do with the money you're managing is to do good with it. Don't do evil with it. Don't spend it on things that are wrong, but do good with it. Keep your finger here and go to the book of Proverbs for a moment and look at Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. 327. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give you tomorrow 
when you have it with you now. These are tough verses. I struggle with this. You struggle with it too. But the Bible is saying when you've got it in your hand, do good with it. Be, be generous. Give it. That's the second thing. Be generous. Don't be stingy. The Lord loves a cheerful giver, so give. You see a need, meet that need. Some basic guidelines. I've got four that I would ask you to write down if you are to manage well the wealth, however much it is. Number one, develop contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Learn how to be content with what you have. And be sure you teach your children that to be content. Paul said, I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to have a lot. I know how to have little. I've learned in every situation to be content. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13, verse 5, keep free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Now, you'll get some help on that if you will learn that you don't have to own everything in order to enjoy it. You like, you like beautiful art? You don't have to spend a million dollars to buy that Picasso or, or that Monet. You can just go over into D.C. to one of the great museums or one of the great art galleries, and you can stand there all day and look at it and get just as much pleasure from it. You don't have to own it. When Audrey and I first started out our marriage, we had nothing. I mean, we, we literally had nothing. And so when it came to anniversaries and Valentine's Day, we couldn't purchase gifts. So we would go to the Hallmark store, and we would uh, separate there, and we'd each find a, a card for each other, a beautiful card expressing our love. We would take it, and we'd give it to each other. We'd read it, and then we'd put it back on the shelf. <laughs> Well, what do you do with the cards after you read them? <laughs> we, I got every bit of mileage out of it just as if I bought it. <laughs> About that same time, a movie came out that, that I dearly loved. It, it was called uh, Somewhere in Time. Beautiful movie about time travel and romance. And it was centered around the beautiful Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island up in Michigan. And I just had it in my heart to take Audrey there uh, to share that romance with her. And so we were on vacation. We were driving, and we, uh, we went up into uh, the Michigan area. And this is really before cell phones and Google and everything. So we stopped en route, and we called ahead to see if we could get a room. And uh, when they told us how much it cost for one night, I'd never heard such a thing. I mean, I couldn't imagine anybody pay that for a night. And we didn't have it. So we decided to go on and go to the Grand Hotel, and we had lunch on their beautiful veranda and just and loved it. And then we went into the, the lobby, and we sat down, and we nodded at people as they passed through. <laughs> and then when it was time to leave, we just got out and walked out and left. Well, what else were we going to do? If we'd, if we'd had a room, we'd have gone to the room, shut the door, and it would have been like any other motel in America. We had every bit of joy from it, and it really didn't cost much of anything. You can be content with what you've got if you learn how to enjoy things without having to own them. I'd much rather you have a swimming pool at your house <laughs> than that I would have one if you'll invite me over. That's, that's where I'm going with that. Be content. Learn contentment. Second thing, increase your giving. If you can give it, then it is not your God. If you can pry your hands off of it, it doesn't possess you. You're in possession, and you freely give. Number three, express gratitude for what you have. That's why you pray that prayer of blessing over a meal. You're thanking God that you got something to eat. But pray at other times, too, and just express to God gratitude that he's given you what you've had. And if you can give praise to God for it, again, it doesn't possess you. And here's the last thing. Honor God first with all that you possess. Now, I know you've got college loans to pay off, and you've got a mortgage or rent 
or condo fees, and you've got bills to pay. But when that paycheck comes in, honor God first. The tithe, 10%, right off the top. Honor God with it. Turn to, back to Proverbs chapter 3 again, same chapter we were at a moment ago, and look at verse 9. Proverbs 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Give him the first fruits, not the leftovers, not what you've got when everything else is paid, but honor God first. Now go back to 1 Timothy, one line, I want you to see it again. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The best kind of life at all comes when God is first place in your life and money is in its proper place. You worship God, you use money for the furtherance of his kingdom. Lloyd Ogilvy uh, used to be chaplain of the United States Senate. He used to tell the story of, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but he, he would tell the story of two grave diggers who had the most unusual assignment they'd ever been given. They were sent out to the cemetery, and they were to dig a massive grave, uh, six feet uh, long, 15 feet wide, about 10 feet deep. And they were perplexed by this. Who wants a grave that big? Well, they finish digging, and along comes the hearse. There is no family. There are no mourners, just the hearse and the funeral director. And it pulls up alongside the grave. They open the back of the hearse. It is a very plain and simple casket. Again, the grave diggers just don't understand that. They're getting ready to deal with it when a truck pulls up beside the hearse. And on the back of the truck is a gold-plated Rolls Royce. And the funeral director opens the hearse, takes out the casket, opens it, and takes the corpse of the man. He's well-dressed, but nothing, nothing uh, to indicate great wealth, but he's well-dressed. And they open the door of the Rolls Royce, and they put him in the front seat, and they put his cold, dead hands around the steering wheel, and he's sitting there. Then a crane lifts the Rolls Royce up and lowers it gently into the grave. And one grave digger turns to the other and says, Man, that's living. <laughs> but it isn't, is it? I mean, he's just as dead as anybody else. We brought nothing in. We can take nothing out. So while we're living, while we have it, let's do something of great consequence with it. And our church has a challenge for that very thing, I invite you to be a part of it. Let's pray together. Would you bow with me? We're going to sing in a moment, and maybe you're here today, and you've recently given your life to Jesus, and you want folks to know it. You want to take your stand. In just a moment, I want you to come forward, and by your coming, you're letting us know, and we'll baptize you in days to come. Maybe you've already made the decision. Maybe you've decided here and now, today, that this is what you want to do with your life. If you're here and looking for a church to be a part of, and you are a Christian, we certainly open our doors to you. If you would come, you step out. Father, speak to every heart in life now and call us in radical commitment to you. Give us courage to respond, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Would you pray with me? Lord, we're so thankful that you've brought us safely into your house today. Lord, we're thankful for this congregation. Lord, uh, we're thankful for the leaders with which you've appointed us. Uh, Lord, we ask you be with those who couldn't make it here today. Lord, we ask that you protect those in uniform as they serve our community and around the world. And Lord, we just ask you today that you help to guide our minds and our decisions, Lord, and, and just that we be content with what you provide, Lord, that we faithfully follow you in, in all of our decisions. Lord, we ask that as we return a portion of our wealth today, Lord, we ask that you bless it to continue to reach those so that they might also walk with you daily. We bless these things in Jesus' name. Amen.